boy, I love the kitchen here at the Dwight House. Especially this fireplace. Look at this. It's practically walk-in made out of stone and brick with this wooden lintel. You know, I don't know what they were thinking of when they built this. How could a piece of wood like this survive in front of all the roaring fires that were in here? Somehow it did. And the masonry is almost continuous. It comes down through the fireplace area right into the floor. This is the uh, formal parlor. Another room filled with nice antiques. And here's the mirror that I want you to see. There's scores of these throughout the museum, but none better than this one or more elegant. Nice fretwork, probably all cut with a handsaw. Seems to be a mahogany. And a nice molding that surrounds the mirror. With some mitered corners. I think we have to have a couple of these. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with each of your power tools. Knowing how to use your tools safely will considerably lessen the possibility of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now I'll show you how to build this Chippendale mirror. Well, I suspect that the craftsman who built that Chippendale mirror that we saw at Old Deerfield probably raise his eyebrows a bit if he saw how I built ours. First of all, I backed the fretwork with a piece of high-pressure laminate. And that's because I noticed that on the solid fretwork, some of the corners tend to chip away and break. And I think this will hold it all together. Also, the applied molding that goes around the mirror was not turned out with a hand plane. It was turned out with my router table and joiner. And the fretwork was not cut with a hand coping saw. It was cut with a modern scroll saw. Now, to get started, I think I'm going to make the material that holds the mirror in place. It has this little cove right here. So I took some inch and a quarter by three quarter inch mahogany. And before I rabbit it out, I'm going to make the cove because it's a little bit easier. Now here's my piece of stock some one by mahogany that's been ripped down to the right width, about eight, nine feet long. I'm going to make the cove on my router table, which is nothing more than a router motor mounted underneath this relatively large table. There's also a fence. And this black portion is the fence that comes with the equipment. But I usually add an auxiliary fence, generally higher. And that allows me to clamp on jigs, and in this case, a feather board, which is nothing more than a piece of one by stock cut at about a 15, 20 degree angle, several saw cuts in it, so they act like fingers holding the work, in this case for this one, down to the table, and in this one, up against the rip fence. Now the cutter is a half inch cove bit, and I've raised it so that it's just slightly above the table to remove the material that I want. I've installed another feather board here at my table saw. The principle is the same, to hold the stock tightly against the rip fence as I push it through. Now to make the rabbit, the first cut will be done with the cove against the fence and facing down. I'm going to cut about 3 quarters of an inch deep. Now for the next pass, I've raised the blade slightly move the rip fence a little bit to the right, and with the piece in the same orientation, I'll make the first cut for a rabbit that's going to hold the plywood back. Well, now I'm ready to make a couple passes to complete the rabbits. The first pass will be right in this area, right here. We'll cut through both of these little slivers, but it makes the rabbit for the mirror. The second pass will be right here, and that makes a rabbit for the plywood. In both cases, the cove will be up and towards the rip fence.
Now, when you look at the mirror from the face side, there's a bit of a deception. The top corners are at a 45-degree angle. Yet if we look at the back, the frame is perfectly rectangular with 90-degree angles and mitered corners. I'm going to make those miter cuts here at the chop saw. The first thing I'm going to do is swing it over to 45 degrees and make one cut. I'm going to set my saw stop. And you know I'm going to cut these pieces about an eighth of an inch longer than they need to be. And I'll show you why in a minute. Swing the saw back over to the other side of 45 and cut it off. And now I'll cut another one the same length. OK, now that takes care of the two long pieces for the frame. I'm going to bring all these pieces to the workbench where I'm going to make the final cuts using this tool right here. It's a trimmer. It actually has an arm on it here that you move back and forth. And there's two heavy cutters. They act like a guillotine. They just shave the wood off. Now, for guides, they've got these f fences right here. Set up at 45 now, but you can swing it to 90 or pretty much any place between. The idea is to just trim off a little bit of material at a time. It shaves it perfectly clean. Ah, now, that's what I call fine-tuning a miter joint. Now, measuring from the end that I just trimmed, I'm going to mark the exact length, which for this short piece is 15 and 3 quarters. Then going to the opposite end of the tool, I slide the piece in, aligning my pencil mark with the intersection of this face right here of the fence, and trim it off. Well, now there are as many ways to clamp these frames together as there are picture framers or mirror framers, I suppose. This device seems to work pretty well. It's real simple. Threaded rod that goes into angled corners, perfect 90 degrees, and just wing nuts to tighten it together. What you do is actually set your pieces in dry first and get it so that it's approximately where it should be in, in terms of size. Just bring it snugly together. And once that's done, you're ready to start gluing up. So we'll just take one short piece out and apply a little bit of glue to the miter. Spread it with a brush. With both ends glued, I can just slip it into place. And I won't do any clamping, though, until I finish gluing the other side. When it's all clamped, I'll just let it set in these for a while as the glue dries. Now we'll just set that aside to dry and start looking at the fretwork. Now what I did last night before I left the shop was I took a couple pieces of 1 by 12 and planed them down so they were about 5 sixteenths of an inch thick and then edge glued them together. And now that it's dry, I can take the clamps off. Well, they don't call us Yankees for nothing. The Yankees don't throw anything away, especially here at the workshop. And here you can see a bunch of scraps of plywood, but I also have some scraps of laminate. In fact, this is a piece that was left over from a project I did last year. Now, I cut the piece so that it's just about the same size as my blank, nothing fancy. And the idea is to glue the two pieces together. And to do that, I'm going to use a contact cement putting a light coat on each piece and letting it dry until it's just tacky. I use this paper cup method because I don't want glue all over my can because it's a big can. I'm not going to use all of it in one shot. Now to spread it, I'm just going to use a scrap of laminate. 
and just evenly move it around. I want to move fairly quickly here because this will dry pretty fast. Now feeling both pieces, the glue is just tacky, but it doesn't come away on my finger as I touch it. So it's ready to be bonded together. All you really have to do is carefully lay the laminate on top of the wood. And you've got to get it lined up because there's no second chance with this stuff. And just press it down with your hand to start. Then using this little J roller, go from the middle to the edge and press it down. I've made a pattern of all the fretwork and laid it out on some poster board and cut it out. And now I'll just use that as a pattern to lay out the mahogany. Now you might have noticed that my pattern is actually longer than my blank. And that's deliberate. I only need to get two pieces out of this blank. The top fretwork and the bottom fretwork. The area in between is only the frame that holds the two pieces together. It also allows me to cut it in half so that it'll be easier to handle it when I get to the scroll saw. Now the scroll saw, not something you see every day in the shop, but it comes in handy when you need it. Basically, it's an automated version of the coping saw. It uses a thin blade so that you can cut a tight radius. And the action is up and down. It just strokes up and down. You can control the speed down here. And the speed will depend on the thickness of the material, how hard it is, and what size the blade is that you're using. And another great little feature is this tube, which actually blows air out from the bottom to keep your sight line clear. Works great. that scroll saw does a nice job. In fact, it cuts the wood so smoothly that I don't think I'm going to have to do much sanding here along the edge. Maybe a little touch up before I put the finish on. Now I think the frame has had enough time sitting in the clamp that it's dry so we can continue with the work. Now to reinforce the corners, I'm going to put a couple one inch brads holding them towards the back side of the frame, one in from each direction. When I cut the fretwork for the mirror, I made it a little bit narrower. The opening is narrower than the outside dimensions of the frame. I also left some room at the bottom. And that's so that I can run a rabbit around the edges to hold the fretwork in place. So what I have to do now is just lay out the location of where the fretwork stops on this side and this side, because I don't want the rabbits running through. Now, to make the rabbit, I'm going to turn to my router table once again. This time, it's set up with a 3 8 inch straight cutting bit. And I've also installed this 
stop block. And what that is is a guide. I have to make two cuts where I need to plunge the work in and push it through. And that guide tells me where to start. Now I'll just move my guide block to the other line, which is the leading edge of the bit, and finish the ravening. Now with a sharp utility knife and a chisel, I'm going to square up the ends of those rabbits. Well, so far we've got a frame with four 90 degree corners. And that's okay down at the bottom, but at the top I want to have a little angled section of this cove. So we'll do that next. I've just made the first of two cuts I need for that piece. One here, and then I'll make another one over here, both at 22 and a half degrees. Notice I didn't cut all the way through. I don't want to lose the whole frame. I want to keep this corner tied together. Now, to remove the material between the two cuts, I could use a chisel and a hammer, but that much impact might loosen up this joint. So I'm just going to use my router, which I've set up with a half-inch mortising bit, and carefully remove the material. Now to fill in between the two cuts, I'm going to use the same molding that I used to make the frame, except I don't need all of it. I only need this top portion. I'll just rip off the excess. Well, no clamps or nails here, just a little bit of glue to hold it in place. Now the rest of the material down to my rabbit, I'll simply remove with my chisel. Well, that's what it should look like. Now we're ready to apply the fretwork to all of this assembly. Now I'm going to attach the fretwork to the frame with some hot glue. I don't have any time to talk about this very long because the glue sets quickly. Now I'll just put in a couple brads. You know, attaching the fretwork in this manner really makes it strong. It ties everything together. Notice that the final assembly is a molding that goes all the way around the mirror, a flat piece of stock that's been shaped. And to make the mold, I'm going to use my router table. I'm starting out with some 7 8 inch by 3 quarter inch stock, and I'm using an OG bit. But the real trick here is the jig. I've cut some little wedges at 30 degrees, which I've just tacked to my wooden fence. I've cut another piece here with a bevel at 60 degrees, giving me a nice 90 degree corner. And I've also installed the featherboard once again to hold the stock down. It works really well. Watch. Well, 
now I'm going to turn to my joiner to make one more improvement on this molding. I don't like this little point coming down, so I'm going to run it through just flattening that out. So I've adjusted the fence and the blade, and I'll run it through. One final pass through the table saw gives me the thickness that I need. Now this is the time that I want to give everything a light sanding to remove any pencil marks and to make sure that the fretwork is flush with the frame. Well, once again, I'm turning to my miter box to make the initial cuts for this molding. And then I'll use the trimmer to fine tune them. You know, a little bit of glue to help hold everything together. And I'll just hold everything in place with a few little brads. Now you really see the value of this molding. It does a real good job in concealing the joint between the fretwork and the frame. That takes care of that molding. Now, I guess before I put the mirror in this frame, I have to seriously consider how I'm going to finish it. I guess one of the reasons that furniture makers like working with mahogany so much is because it's a very porous wood. So it takes stain very well. It goes deeply into the grain. Now, for this piece, I'm using a wild cherry stain. I'll give it a light coat, let it sit for a while, and then rub the excess off. Now before the stain gets completely dry, I'm just taking a clean rag and rubbing the stain so that I take off any of the excess. It also allows me to control the color. And finally, a couple coats of a very hard gloss polyurethane. And this piece is just about ready to hang on the wall. <laughs>